Thanks for. Now we finally start our uh, case study sessions. So, actually, we have six uh, case studies uh, for this conference from our six country uh, Africa country programs, and then Ghana. Since Ghana is host country, we are honored to be the first one. I should say, and um, this is a team uh, team effort, team work. Uh, Shashi is our country program leader. He is sitting there. He just told me yesterday I should present. I think he is too busy actually for organizing this conference. That's why I'm honored to represent Shashi to present uh, the Ghana case. So basically, for all six country cases, we have our similar uh, structures. But for different country, we know they have different uh, stories to tell. So that's why for each of us, our presentations actually will be slightly different. First of all, we, for, for most of country case studies, we first we want to see what ha happened in our Africa countries in terms of structure transformation. That's why we have put a lot of effort into what? What have happened? Actually, by the end, we raised a lot of questions on why. So we haven't had op opportunity and the time to answer all of the why. Actually, gave us opportunity to raise why to all of you guys to help us actually think about it. So we heard about Ghana all these days. So Ghana was famous as the first independent country, was famous as the first uh, structure transformation country also has been famous all these decades. So one important factor actually we haven't talked about a lot is Ghana has sustainable, very steady growth rate in almost three decades. So we are talking about steady uh, growth rate, we are talking about non-zero growth rate in almost 30 years. So if you, you check WDI, you can barely find more than five countries in the world, including United States. So in 30 years, zero negative per capita growth rate. Of course, Ghana's growth rate is not high. It's not like China, like even Mozambique. We are talking about like 5% growth rate, but very steady growth. Of course, early growth after structure transformation was recovery, but now China Actually, no, no, China, Ghana has reached so-called middle income stage past the 1,000 per capita. Uh, this kind of growth performance also people related to three very important characteristics of this country. Political stability, institution stability, and microeconomic stability. Moreover, Ghana also is, is a country, one of a few Africa countries will meet MDG1, half in poverty, before target year 2050. Now for this conference, we focus more on the structure side, uh, structure transform, tr transformation side. We see from the second graph, we see agriculture share decline. It's not tremendous decline. It declined, especially after 2008 uh, GDP rebating, agriculture share finally actually fall below services. It's about 30%. The re reduced share of agriculture actually is, is replaced by increased share of services. We see a very st actually st stable industry share in the economy. If we consider rebating after 2005, actually the share of industry declined in the economy. We didn't show in this, my, in this figure is manufacturing sector. It's actually unsurprised. It's kind of surprise for me. The share is below 10 percent, even below actually the early stage post independent. So we also see the export sector is relative concentrated in cocoa, gold. With the discovery of oil, we will see the economy become more dependent on natural resources. So now we are going to through these three sector one by one. So we talk about a lot about cocoa, but actually cocoa is not the big, biggest sector in this country in terms of agriculture. Cocoa only grow in the forest area. Also, it's a smallholder crops. 
It's not like plantation in many other countries. So cocoa account about actually only 15% agriculture GDP. On the other side, it's majority export. So agriculture growth from some point of view actually is driven by cocoa. So it's driven by the cocoa expansion from some point of view, very little actually driven by the cocoa's productivity increase. Similar for other crops, the, the productivity improvement is relatively low. Area expansion is still the major force of the growth. Also, we see that because urbanization, the increased demand in the domestic market actually start to become more competitive with the import food. On the one side, we see increased export from cocoa and non-traditional agriculture crop. On the other side, we see increased import of food. For example, rice actually is growing in Ghana, but now we are consuming maybe more than 50% rice imported from Thailand, China, and other countries. Chicken is another commodity. Each Ghanaian farmer, they have a chicken, but now what we eat, lunch and dinner, actually all imported. I import chicken count about almost 70% of uh, domestic consumption. So if we exclude cocoa from export, actually Ghana is a net importer in agriculture good. So on the employment side, we still see majority of workers working in agriculture. But like Louis said this morning, their livelihood is mixed. So many of them, they are not full-time uh, workers in agriculture. Now we look at industry sectors. So we break down industry by, by four major activities. So manufacture used to be about 30% of total industry. And no, 35% total industry. Now it's declining. It's replaced by construction. Construction actually become the biggest industry sector in this country. Mining, we know, is basically gold. So manufacturer sector itself didn't perform very well. So if we look at last eight years, the average growth rate only about 1%. And manufacturing mainly is egg processing. We heard from yesterday, the competition in egg processing actually increased, even in the materials uh, part. And also in terms of firms, most of formal firms are small. It's small is fine, in many countries firms are small. The point is a dynamic. They are small from beginning and died. So big, big company is created as a big. And then they, they don't, we don't see the dynamic. You grew up from small, eventually become Toyota in Ghana. But mainly small, just small, and forever. You all continue to be small. And now Ghana attracts a lot of foreign investment. However, mining is the first sector most of foreign investment go, of course, mainly from China. Plus services, like this nice hotel you can see in Accra, many of them, they were built by foreigners. So in terms of employment, industry as a whole only created 15% employment. So now we come to services. When we talk about services, people always say, what, what the services is? Actually, in this country, one third of services government related. We are talking about government related. We include public administration, health, education. These two components mainly run by public sectors. And then in terms of employment, at the formal number is 30%. But we know it's significant, actually estimated, given the huge informal activities. So yesterday, we talked about the linkages. So once you have uh, agriculture, industry, service, of course, they link. However, in the uh, open economy, also in the uh, sector, in the agriculture <laughs> sector with relative <laughs> static productivity growth, actually linkage. Kind of so agriculture <coughs> only use very little input from agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. Thirteen percent of total agriculture production. 
it's not too small given agriculture is much bigger, manufacturing is much smaller in the whole economy. Of course, manufacture sector itself always has strongest sector linkage within manufacturers. But this is not necessarily true for domestic production, given Ghana is a very open economy. They may import and process a little bit and uh, send it to the market. So consumption linkage has been emphasized in the early stage of development. Yesterday, there are a lot of this debate about this. It is true for the open economy, such linkage had been weakened, especially for Ghana's very open economy, expected in the domestic service sector. So we see cities more like consumption cities. Like this hotel you can find, not at this kind of quality, but similar kind of purpose. You can find maybe mainly in, in Aqua. So when the, the previous uh, presentation talked about migration, internal migration. It is true, it's very difficult to find the data about it. But from uh, the knowledge we heard, an expert talked about the better of actually 1,000 to 1,000 migration. The north to south migration actually relative low. So now we move to spatial uh, structure change. So Actually, for, for our case studies, we try to not only look at out, output structure transformation, also spatial transformation, especially the linkage between rural and urban economy. So that's why now we move to more agglomeration analysis. We use agglomeration methods to look at these uh, linkages. So here we present the map for Ghana. So we, we present like different color of dust, they represent the different sides of urban agglomerations. So about 47% of population <laughs> live in agglomeration, agglomerated urban area. It's not necessarily the same as UN definition of uh, urban And then we see there are two very big like, uh, urban areas, Accra and Kumasi. So each has more than 1.5 million population. Two of them together actually have more than 50% urban population. Below that, there's no city between million and 500. Immediately, we went to the second category is 100 and 500. So about 10 cities, we call mid-sized urban cities. And then there are more than 100 small towns. They are mainly administrative, uh, 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 district uh, capital, we call. More importantly, we also see urban areas have a quite big peripheries, so they are very connected with urban. So when we use agglomeration index to measure urban basic, we consider access condition, we call traveling time, and the population density, and the cluster of population. So the periphery area, they have a similar traveling time as urban area but they have much, much lower population density. So this gave us actually more thinking for the future Ghana. It is possible the city continue to grow, so all of the periphery eventually become part of urban. Or we have a different strategy we think about to develop more urban-oriented agriculture. The, the point is once we put the country by different location, we are more interested in the question whether the spatial patterns affect the whole economic transformation. What's, what's the implication for jobs? So now we, are, we, we first look at agriculture, non-agriculture. So urban agglomeration, by definition, is supposed to create non-agriculture jobs. It is true, now there are about 60% of households. They a kind of income. So this analysis actually is based on household level data now. So we use maybe similar data Louise used for, for her presentation, the living standard survey. But we didn't look at uh, occupation story, we look at actually income story. So now if we focus on rural 44 in 2005, 2006, 
by three different locations. Unfortunately, household survey do not have a geo ID for individual households. That's why we cannot identify household by locations. Fortunately, actually Ghana has so many districts. So there are more than 100 districts for this country. So that's why we try to locate each district according to how close to the geographic they find to large urban centers and then 10 medium urban and the rest of the country we call small town. So from the, from the uh, graph, you see the pattern clearly. So urban has, large urban has a higher non-agriculture share, it's obviously. And then, but we also see these two different colors of bars that represent two years of uh, uh, shares. We see the increase of non-agriculture share in total income. Actually, we also notice the increase much more in small town, which represent small urban towns and the rest of the rural areas. So it is true, location matters not only for urban, but also rural household. That's why we present the numbers, which are not in the graphs, only for rural household in three different locations. We see in large urban locations, at the periphery area of the large urban, uh, rural households, they have more than 60% income coming from non-agriculture now. And then the rest of the urban plus the place close to small town, only f about 50%. So that's a big picture between agriculture and non-agriculture. The next question is, what kind of uh, uh, activities in non-agriculture? So we are talking about something similar at Louis' presentation. So for Ghana, we don't call home-based whatever enterprise. They call self-employment. So self-employment for me is more accurate characterize the, the, the situation. They may not be in their hometown. They may be in Accra, but home may be somewhere. So it's more their source of incomes. They, don't be, they are not be hired by anybody else. It's more their self-employed activities. So when we compare self-employed activities and the wage income, remember even wage income, there's a little bit informal. But even we just assume they are all formal sectors. We say actually the most of non agriculture income come from self employee uh, activities. This is a case for urban, also is a case for rural, for the first graph. So these two bar added together actually is, is this bar. So basically we break down this longer bar into two parts. So Everywhere in urban, self-employment income count about more than 50% of non-agriculture income. The wage income is about 35% in large and medium urban for urban households. But when we move to rural, of course, they mainly, their income mainly from self-employment. And then we also try to see the, the dynamic part. So if we trade self-employment income at 100, for the whole country. So in the first run survey, which is 98, 99, majority of such income actually is earned by household live in the large urban areas. It's about, uh, you say the six, we, we put the number there, 18% of total population at that time live in two big large cities, Accra and Kumasi, as an urban household but they earn almost 50% of total self-employed income for the country as a whole. The situation starts to change. Now in 2005, 2006, we say small town urban household, they are more than double their share in national total uh, self-employed uh, pie. So they are about 17% of total population, they are urban by definition. Now they are about 15% of European power income. It's pretty much consistent with their share of population now. So now this is the first question. So what kind of activity they are in? Like Luis argued, this is the biggest economic activity in many Africa countries. 
So they create a job for themselves. But the question is what government is supposed to do for them. The next question for us, OK, what kind of economic activity they are in? So if we talk about self-employment, people may think about, oh, the sector story we present before maybe underestimate manufacturer sector. Maybe because a lot of informal manufacturer sector will not count as a part of industry GDP. That's why for this slide, we focus on manufacture and services. In the survey, after you are asked whether you have a non-farm activity, they ask what kind of activity you are in. So for industry, they break down into many, mining, construction, whatever. In services, they also have quite a detailed breakdown. So at this moment, we only look at services as a total and manufacture as a total. So we see actually the different story now. Most of uh, non-agriculture incomes actually from services. We see the service bar in the first uh, uh, figure uh, above 70 percent, almost 80 percent for all urban households. Also for rural households live in the periphery area for large urban. Close to 70 percent for medium sized urban periphery rural households. And the manufacturer's contribution to non-agricultural income actually is consistent low. No matter in large urban, medium urban, small town for urban households. Actually, we see relative larger share in medium and small town rural households. Remember, Luis mentioned what's the manufacturing mean over there. You produce fufu, you, you, you mill rice and uh, garo, whatever they call manufacturers. So that's why it's more like home re consumption related processing. Uh, we still count it as a manufacturer. Even if we count all of this, the share actually is quite low. Now we further look at within relative formal economy and the relative informal economy, what they are doing. That's why we break down by wage income only household means this group of households, their non-agricultural income only come from wage income. Versus rest of household, they have a self-employed income or they also have wage income. So the first group household is about 18% of whole samples. The second group is about 30%. So actually we see within wage income group household, only in large urban, the the manufacturing income is about roughly 18% of total uh, non-agricultural income. For medium urban or small town, it's below 10%. It's consistent with what I explained why small, uh, small town and medium town, they have relatively larger manufacturing shares because they are mainly self-employed to, to produce small things for consumer directly. But still here, large urban share is much smaller. So given the fact we have a such huge services, maybe we should ask what kind of services we are talking about. Now we go to services. So we break down by, by the household with wage income only, remember that 18% household versus another 30% household, they have a certain employee income. Some of them, they also have wage income. So for wage earners, if we only look at this group, actually public related salary, actually they are mainly wage income, almost 60%. And the rest of uh, services actually quite small. When we move to self-employed income group, remember this is about 30% the whole sample. Majority service income actually is just commerce, all kind of petty trading, all of this kind of activity, 19%. So that both of them, we, 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 we can imagine is very related to consumption, very little related to actual production linkage. To conclude our uh, case studies, actually we read some questions and also we summarize some findings. First of all, very clearly, Ghana has not taken the path taken by many successful transformed countries in Asia 
some cases in Latin America. Means it's not manufacturer driven, it's a missing sector pretty much in the whole process. We see indeed urbanization is very rapidly, urbanization and the growing income should create a demand for our agriculture. But on the other side, we see local products are not competitive with actually this kind of demand. What we consume today, you will see very few actually from the country. We also see, indeed, urbanization created jobs. Most of such jobs are informal ones and concentrate in the domestic oriented services. With these three kind of stylized facts, we raise the three questions. The first question is we like to talk about manufacture, not only for among academics, even among the government. They want Ghana to become industrialized country in 2020. The question is how can manufacture be developed with the current economic situation? Without a more productive agriculture base, whether manufacture can kick out. And then the, since we have such big service sectors, the question becomes whether we can develop services like India, like cost center in India, in Malaysia, whether we can move from consumption-oriented services to productive-oriented service, more export-oriented service, instead of emphasize manufacture in the whole process. And then finally, at the IPRIS staff, we have to raise question for agriculture. So the Ghana face a different story from what we are talking about in China, in many Asian countries, we are talking about 50% population live in urban. They consume different kind of goods. So in this way, to modernize agriculture with such huge urban population, they are what we can do. So they attract more young people <coughs> and they consume more kind of import-oriented food. So what kind of strategy we should think about? Thanks. <laughs>